You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Wednesday. June 12th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Professor Fred Block. His book, Capitalism, The Future of an Illusion. Also on the program today, a vote to hold Attorney General Barr and Commerce Secretary Ross in contempt of Congress to be held today. As... Trump claims executive privilege to hide the details on the question of the 2020 census, which now a dead man has told some very, very disturbing tales about. Meanwhile, White House will also intervene in the DOJ Judiciary Committee deal and decide what Congress gets to see of the unredacted Mueller report. Rokahana, Bernie Sanders' call for Lula's release from prison. Bernie set for a major speech this afternoon. Plans to call Trump a corporate socialist. Republicans impose a poll tax on ex-felons that... Florida voters thought they had re-enfranchised. And score another one for Governor Cynthia Nixon. New York State strengthens its rent control protections. Nothing but respect for my governor. Trump claims executive... Oh, sorry, did that. And elections have consequences. Wisconsin State Supreme Court question... Excuse me, so Wisconsin State Supreme Court hobbles the Democratic governor. And we're still in Kansas anymore. The lead architect of the Republican tax cuts admits the ca- that tax cuts don't pay for themselves. And while billionaires, Arthur laughing themselves to the bank. Yeah, sorry. And Trump ready to okay mining near the Grand Canyon. Make the Grand Canyon grand again. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Um, oh, let's, you know what? Let's show the video uh, that, uh, do we have that video? I was walking to work today and uh, walking by um, Barclays Center which is a uh, big uh, stadium, as it were. A glowing spaceship owned by Jay-Z. Indeed. And um, it's actually a very good documentary about the fight that brought us that. And it was a classic um, classic uh, uh, Jesus, I can't, I don't even remember. Who was it during... uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, era stuff where uh, they basically did this huge giveaway to a uh, developer and um, sort of forced a whole area into blight as a way of uh, condemning it. I think it was, I can't remember, Battle for Brooklyn, I think was the name of the documentary. So worth watching. Um, <clears throat> and actually, and maybe in the deep archives, I think we have an interview or maybe it's on this show. I can't remember. Uh, nevertheless, I was walking by today, and uh, this is the first picture I, I took because I saw these cops with a chainsaw, and they were sawing a chain off of uh, uh, this uh, this post there, and there was an installation. It's cage 
uh, that said uh, no kids in cages, and it had a child, um, I think a, a replica of a child, wrapped in a blanket in the cage. As far as I can tell, it was, uh, it is a, um, there are many of these being put around by an organization called Races, R-A-I-C-E-S. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter. I think it's Races for Texas or Races Texas. Um, good organization, actually, that I think is worth your support. Um, coincidentally, I've, I've supported them in the past, and I think you should check, check them out. Um, they, they hauled this and put it away. What I, did not, uh, what I was not aware of was that there was sound initially associated with these, I believe, in the cages. But maybe they had, uh, I'm not sure that the, the sound had run out or what, but here is an image that must have been taken an hour or two before I got there um, when they had set this up. And here it is. Yeah, this video here. So there's hashtags, no kids in cages. Um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we've just, you know, got reports that they're moving uh, kids to uh, detention centers, so-called detention centers um, on military bases. Uh, it's just getting worse. And um, uh, the more attention we can uh, drive to this, the better. Meanwhile, the... Um, the House Oversight Committee will be voting, I believe, at about 2 o'clock today uh, on contempt charges against Bill Barr and Wilbur Ross. In short, the issue here is, how did a question about uh, citizenship end up in the 2020 census? And we have never had one in the history of this country. The census calls for the measurement of all peoples in the United States. This is a constitutional requirement, not citizens. The citizenship question was inserted between the DOJ and Commerce Department. It's actually in front of the Supreme Court right now. The argument that the DOJ said was, oh, we needed this to enforce the Voting Rights Act. In certain districts, we needed to make sure that there was enough minority representation uh, in elected offices. Now, the Voting Rights Act has been in effect for over 50 years. The DOJ has never needed this information. And uh, this case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is deliberating on it. Uh, One week ago, maybe two weeks ago, it was revealed that it's been found on a dead Republican operative's computer by his daughter that he had drawn up extensive plans for this question and actually had done models, statistical models, how this plan, if this question was asked on the census, how would it impact voting uh, patterns in Texas? How would it, uh, who would it favor? They found, I'm paraphrasing, but I think it's actually a direct quote, it will help non-Hispanic whites and Republicans gain more electoral power in Texas. Then this same guy drafted letters that were used verbatim by the DOJ to send to Commerce for this request. So the uh, the House Oversight Committee is looking for information between these two, and Donald Trump has now claimed executive privilege. Why the White House would have anything to do with this at all is beyond me. Well, it's not. I understand why they would do this, but their justification for it. Here's Elijah Cummings. We also now have evidence that President Trump's advisors began discussing citizenship questions 
long before the president took office. After his inauguration, the president discussed the idea with his top White House aides, Rince Priebus and Steve Bannon, who in turn pressed it with Secretary Ross. And although we have limited information about this scheme, we've been blocked from fully determining the real reason the administration sought to add the citizenship question. We know the real reason. I mean, it's all there in those hard drives, and that has been uh, admitted to the courts. Um, So there's a lot of things going on here around this issue. One is the obstruction that the um, White House is involved in in hiding this material. The other is whether the Supreme Court is actually going to take the fact that there's all this documentation that all but proves, in fact, I would say proves that the reason why the DOJ asked for this information, this question to be in there was part of a political program, not one by necessity. This is a constitutional requirement that they're infringing upon. And they are knowingly doing it, and there's documentation to prove it. Here's AOC at that same uh, hearing. I think that this is a debate about whether we should be asking who is a citizen or not in this country. The census is a constitutionally mandated operation that we are required to implement every 10 years. It is one of the most vital and sensitive things that we do in our government. Any change to the census, any addition of a question, usually takes five years of a process to make sure that it is vetted, that every word has been tested, to make sure that it is effective, because it is one of the most important things that we do. So it's not that I want to, this is not about whether or not I want to know who is a citizen in the United States or not. What I want to know is why After why this question was added, why two years have been shaved off of that five-year process. I want to know why we have skipped every normal mandated procedure in testing how this question gets added in the census. I want to know why why this question was magically added after we have seen that a political operative knew and detailed an intent to intimidate racial and immigrant communities for a partisan purpose, saying this will hurt Democrats and help Republicans. That's what I want to know. I want to know why Wilbur Ross, why Secretary Ross, continued to meet with people of disturbing political affiliations after his own administration warned him to stop. He came right here and I asked him, did you continue speaking with him after this? He told me, no, we had an email and he did. He did. I want to know why people like Chris Kobach with a documented history of of overseeing effects. He has a resume of voter suppression techniques in the state of Kansas. I want to know why folks like that have their fingerprints all over the most sensitive census operations that that we have as a United States government. This determines who is here. This determines who has power in the United States of America. That is what we want to know. I want to know about corruption. That's what I want to know about the racism that, and, the, and the very disturbing history that we're seeing here. That's what I want to know. And so we gave the opportunity to ask. We asked, why are all of these things happening? Why is all of this connected? Why are there so many people, everyone from Steve Bannon to Chris Kobach, having their fingerprints and their political intent all over the United States census? Why? And what did we get? Nothing. So we'll hear about that vote today. It's a very important vote. And, and, and just the question of it right now, the invoking of the executive privilege, there's, like I say, there's two major things that are happening here. One is what's going on in the House in terms of this. There's really more than two. There's the underlying question of the census and the implications of adding this question. There is the question as to whether there's going to be real consequences for the White House withholding these documents when they clearly have no reason to do so whatsoever. There's no executive privilege. There's no, 
There's no advice and consent that the president has in regard to the census that should be sensitive in any way if it is not politicized. And then, with all this that's going on, this is going to be, if the, if the Supreme Court rules that this question can stay in, I think it's going to be the inciting event that in the event we do see a, a Democrat control the, uh, the presidency and the Democrats control both houses, you're going to see massive Supreme Court reform based on this very question. Because this is, it would be unconscionable if they ignored this evidence that it was uh, politically motivated. God, props to Hoffler's daughter. Like, can yes. you imagine finding that info on your dead dad's computer? Like, I think secret they, census corruption plans? I have a feeling, my understanding is that their relationship was, was strained. And I have a feeling it had, some, it had stuff to do with his work. I mean, he was considered the architect of the gerrymandering. I mean, this guy was responsible for disenfranchising um, millions of voters. Millions and millions of voters um, and immiserating a lot of people um, as, a, as a result. But with that said, uh, one of today's sponsors is Skillshare. It's quite a pivot. I was going to say, I, I was thinking I'm of looking a... right now, recommended for you on my Skillshare page, how to pivot. Uh, they do not have them that specified. But anyone who goes to skl.sh slash Majority Report 4 is going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Uh, you've heard me talk about these guys a lot. They're a vibrant online co- learning community. They offer courses on everything from design to video editing, phot- photography, business, technology, cooking, meditation. Did I say productivity? Everything in between. Uh, There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You're going to have no problem finding a course that fits what you're looking to do, what you you haven't done, personal, professional, whether you want to sharpen your skills on something that you're good at or learn something you have no idea about. They have courses for entrepreneurs. They have it on uh, coding, um, web development, nutrition, languages, whatever. You name it. Uh, I... This is getting frustrating for me because I just have not had time. I'm with the kids. I got to get home. I got to cook. I don't have uh, even 25 minutes to watch. But uh, every time I go to my page, they keep adding stuff that I want to, they keep recommending stuff that I want to watch. And so I'm banking all this stuff for the weekend. Uh, The newest one that they have is Real Productivity. Create your ideal week. It's 25 minutes. I'm into it. Uh, I've already got on the list. Make a head breakfast. That will change my day. Well, that's and what you need. Lucid you dreaming. The, you lucidly dream your breakfast plan. Then you knock it out. And then you have time to study more skills. There's a Japanese cure for workout procrastination. All these sound incredibly <laughs> that, fascinating. That actually would. That will be literally the first one. Eight that's day awesome. minimalism challenge. Simplify your life and live better. I feel like this is all. Well, it's also the recommended for me. So it is pretty tailored to me. And uh, the chess openings attack the king with the. Uh, Ponziani move. I'll right, give it a try. Should I try at that? And now you can get a two entire months of free access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report for just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report for. And we, as always, have put the link in our YouTube description and our podcast description. Check it out. All right, going to take a quick break. When we come back, professor of sociology at uh, University of California, Davis, Fred Block, on capitalism, the future of an illusion.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of Sociology at UC Davis, Fred Block, on his book, Capitalism, The Future of an Illusion. Uh, welcome to the program, Professor. Thank you for having me. Um, let's start with the, the title. Having been uh, a, a religious studies, uh, a, a government and religious studies um, uh, major back in the day in my undergraduate years, uh, I can only imagine uh, the uh, how compelled you must have been to to use future of an illusion, which of course is uh, an allusion to uh, Sigmund Freud's book as a sociologist. Why why that? Um, he wrote that about uh, religion. Um, why do you use that? To borrow that for uh, capitalism. Well, the idea is that when Freud. Uh, titled his book that and suggested that religion was an illusion. It was quite an outrageous, heretical thing to argue. And what I was trying to suggest is that today to suggest that capitalism isn't a reality, but is an illusion is also completely heretical, even more heretical, since uh, people of all political persuasions, left, right, and center, agree on the idea that we live in a capitalist society. But what I wanted to get at is that the way the term capitalism is today understood um, indicates, is taken to mean that we have an economy that's autonomous, um, that has to operate according to its own inner laws, or else we will suddenly uh, see an end to the prosperity that we've historically enjoyed. So that's the claim, which I believe is, is an illusion, that it's an autonomous, unchanging and unchangeable system. Um, against that view, I'm arguing that what we've seen of as capitalist or market economies have been changing continuously, that every 30, 40 years they undergo uh, dramatic changes in the boundary between the state and the market, uh, tremendous changes in the regulatory apparatus and so forth. So what I'm trying to get at is that uh, this mentality that we can't do anything uh, about our current uh, political economic arrangements because we must obey uh, the god of capitalism, that that's a completely mistaken and um, false, uh, illusory idea. I, I'm, I'm, diver illusionary. I, I'm diverging a little bit from my, my, my game plan here, but as you were saying that, it also occurs to me that on some level, that's also the way that we look at uh, economics to a certain extent. And maybe uh, it, that, that it is also sort of something that exists in a fixed way. And it, we, it's just a question of us getting it right as opposed to it being a series of, of decisions that the body politic makes. Exactly. That the two things are, are, are very closely connected, that, uh, that uh, many of the economists have kind of um, made the argument that the management of the economy is this arcane uh, exercise that only um, the the people with PhDs can possibly understand, and that they know exactly how to move the levers of the economy to achieve objectives, and that ordinary people um, must have no say in this matter, and that that view also is 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 wrong. Uh, the economists don't really understand the economy. Uh, their tools haven't been working. Um, and um, the best contemporary economists uh, recognize the, the need for uh, very si significant uh, reforms to, uh, uh, to address the kind of pressing problems that we, we face of growing inequality, climate change, um, and, and, uh, and frankly, uh, an economy that's not working very effectively despite uh, the president's claims to the contrary. Let, let's, um, um, and you do this in, in your book, let's track the, the evolution of the, uh, the word capitalism, because the, the idea here, um, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, at the end of the day is that 
to understand um, what the word capitalism represents today uh, is to understand why it also represents a uh, an obstacle to um, to uh, a, 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 cha- a political change that will <clears throat> help the economy for everyone. So let's uh, give us the history of the word capitalism, because I think there's some misunderstanding about it. Well, obviously, that's what the book is about. Right. So I've made the argument that what I call linguistic larceny, stealing words and giving them new meanings, uh, has played a much larger role in in politics than than people realize. So the 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 history is that the word capitalism comes from the left. It was the way in which uh, people in the socialist movement. Um, identified what they were against. Um, it comes from Marx. I mean, he, he called his masterwork Capital uh, in, in the aftermath. Um, socialists uh, denounced capitalism. And so a part of what I'm uh, pointing out is that during the Cold War in the 1950s and, and 60s particularly, uh, the word capitalism was completely associated with Soviet propaganda. They would say uh, the U.S. has a capitalist system and it treats black people uh, very badly and it produces inequality and poverty and um, all kinds of terrible things. And polite people, um, centrist people, didn't use the word capitalism. There was a conscious effort to describe the American system as the free enterprise system. And um, I tell the um, story in the book that as a young person, I went to the first SDS march on Washington in 1965 against the Vietnam War. And the president of SDS at that point gave a speech where he said, we must name the system that gave us the Vietnam War, that gives us racial inequality. Um, And he made that the refrain, but he never actually said the word capitalism, I think because the uh, adult organizations that had um, supported the march had told him he couldn't use it because it was so associated with uh, with the far left at that time. So the kind of critical moment in my argument is that I say that um, conservative thinkers, uh, and particularly Irving Kristol, uh, often associated as the kind of leader of neoconservatism, essentially recognized that um, stealing the word capitalism and giving it uh, a new meaning would significantly strengthen the right. So he wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. And essentially, he labeled the system as as capitalism. And he said, uh, you can't change any single part of it. It's a kind of totally unified and coherent system. And so if you increase government regulation, it will have um, very significant costs that will outweigh the benefits of doing that. And so that's been the foundation on which the right has argued that we can't have a tax system that's fairer to working and poor people, working class and poor people. Uh, we can't have better regulation of the petroleum companies. We can't make a transition to clean energy because that will interfere with the fundamental uh, nature of capitalism as a system, and it will en- all end up. Um, terribly poor and 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 suffering um this is the kind of core argument which has been used repeatedly over and over again to block the opportunities for uh reform and change and and even worse than that it's the set of arguments which has been used um to facilitate to make possible a growing um amount of corporate concentration and monopoly so that in industry after industry uh, we have a smaller number of dominant firms uh, that are able to um, avoid competition dictate prices um, uh, in the 
uh, notorious examples of Facebook and, and Google interfere with individual privacy, uh, produce fake news, um, and and so forth. Okay, so I want to I want to just uh, dwell if uh, if we could for for a moment on on that 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 reappropriation or that appropriation, I guess, of the critique, and uh, how you know just from a, from a linguistic standpoint. Um, you know w- w- what's involved in that in that trick. I mean, uh, you write through that. Uh, I think it was was a Forbes magazine uh, used capitalism, uh, ironically, uh, in you know a- as an advertising in this idea of 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 uh, that caught on to sort of appropriate this term used in the Marxist context. Capital is a thing, and capitalism is really just sort of a a series of not necessarily fully uh, related, or I should say, fully synchronized um, elements that are, you know, uh, a certain group of people pursuing a certain group of people pursuing their own uh, specific interests by by labeling by by adopting the term. It 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 took on this notion of something that was cohesive and planned and sort of more scientific. Is that it? As opposed to something that is just like a bunch of people who are pursuing their own interests. Right. So that it's the, the central claim is that the capitalist economy is autonomous and fully coherent, that um, it, it's governed by its own laws and when we pass our laws, we have to defer to those fundamental um, laws. Um, so that that's the core claim, and it's false because um, it's always been substantially more complicated than that. It's political arrangements. It's the role of the state um, that has historic of government that has historically made market economies work effectively and and efficiently, and so their fundamental um, claim is trying to push uh, government to the side and say um, only laissez faire, only allowing the market to regulate itself will produce the desirable outcomes, and what. I'm insisting is that one of the things that happens when you leave the market to itself is that business firms become um, increasingly powerful and they're able to engage in, in predation that rather than making profits by building better mousetraps, by innovating, by developing better products, that they can make money, they can make profits by ripping people off, by treating employees badly, by uh, uh, engaging in pollution, producing greenhouse gases, and and so forth. So uh, the only thing which has protected us from that kind of predatory behavior in the past has been government. When uh, people organize and mobilize and demand that government uh, regulate business, uh, control uh, these forms of predation, that's what's made the market economy work. So the story that I'm trying to tell is just the opposite of the free market story. Uh, What's made the U.S. um, such a powerful um, economic nation historically is because we were the first great democracy. We gave people a voice and they used that voice to rein in economic power. And that the story of the of the 40 years since Ronald Reagan is that we've gone backwards. We we essentially gave up on expanding democracy and using people's voice to regulate business and industry. And instead, uh, we now have these increasingly powerful corporate entities uh, that are making profits at the expense of people rather than by building uh, better mousetraps, innovating, developing better products. So uh, in... in, in uh, I mean, I, I don't want to phrase this as, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the conservative movement uh, got um, got what it wished for, and it ultimately is going to, well, 
theoretically could lead to its demise, uh, one can only hope. But the idea is that, uh, if I understand uh, what you've written, is that once the capitalism became a uh, considered and named as a uh, cohesive system that was sort of fragile and specific, uh, that then provided at least rhetorical and conceptual um, firepower and strength to uh, prevent the government from doing what was necessary to sort of make capitalism, as it were, work for the largest number of people in the country that it could. Um, and uh, so when we had an era where we had things like the New Deal and uh, Medicare and Medicaid, I mean, these uh, reforms that would happen every couple of decades or so over you know, the course of about 50 years, I guess, um, that was uh, done because the, perce- the perception of capitalism was such that it is... Um, you, it, there are evolving problems with it, and you step in to fix those problems as opposed to this is a thing that exists in nature, and all you can do is taint it by, by, by coming in and messing with it. Exactly right. So that uh, back in the Eisenhower era, which people think of as the golden age of, of the economy, uh, the marginal tax rate was uh, 91%. The very rich people, you know, at the margin we're supposed to uh, turn over that much money to the government. Uh, we now have a marginal tax rate, you know, for the rich of 36, 37 percent. A lot of them pay um, much less than that because of the tax breaks built into the system. So um, that um, rather than cutting the tax rate in that dramatic fashion, making the economy work more efficiently, my argument is that it's had exactly the opposite effect that, um, and the, the causality here is the, that Irving Kristol made those arguments in the 1970s. Uh, Ronald Reagan began to implement those free market, so-called free market policies, um, when he took office in 1981. Um, between 1981 and now, the share of of all income earned by the top one percent has more than doubled. So we've dramatically increased the share of the economy that goes to the top one percent, uh, the billionaires that that Bernie Sanders talks about, and and that's money that's not available for for the rest of us. So. The the logic of the argument is exactly as you say, that we need a new era of reform, and um, I'm very enthusiastic about the idea of the Green New Deal, uh, precisely because um, it's an idea that learns from the actual history, that the that the measures of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s um, that made the economy more democratic, more inclusive, uh, allow, uh, uh, enabled the unionization of industrial workers, dramatic um, improvements in, in income distribution. All of that was the basis for the remarkable three decades of prosperity that followed World War II. I'm arguing that if we have a new uh, movement of reform uh, that involves substantial increases in government spending, increases in taxation on the rich and on the corporations, and we use that money um, as in the Green New Deal idea to accelerate uh, this transition to clean energy, but do it in a way that is consciously creating good jobs, uh, supporting the growth of of, of unions. Um, putting people to work who haven't been able to find decent jobs. Um, We can, in fact, um, simultaneously uh, address the pressing issues of climate change, uh, reduce this increased inequality, and we would have a much more uh, dynamic economy that actually meets people's needs. All right, so I want to I want to just uh, go backwards just a little bit. Um, 
and uh, talk about this notion. And it, and it is, I mean, on some level, we've covered this ground a little bit, but um, your uh, your third chapter is the illusion that democracy threatens the economy. And uh, the argument is, and, and to a certain extent, it's it's we, we've, you've articulated it, um, that uh, the economy, the, what they call the Great uh, Compression, um, took place in these years where there was a uh, a far greater amount of democracy I- I involved in uh, the economy insofar as we had the people's will expressed uh, through things like a higher uh, marginal tax rate, through uh, like uh, Social Security, through, um, uh, you know, uh, home ownership programs, uh, you know, and, and broadly, we have to acknowledge that limitations, particularly uh, racial limitations in terms of who was involved in sure. this expansion of democracy into the uh, economy. But with, with that uh, caveat, um, at least relative to where we are today, there was far more democracy uh, insofar as the people's will was was the you know, the uh, was more broadly shared. And it seems to me there's also a, a similar, you know, sort of illusion about or a choice as to what a good economy consists of, right? Because we see a parallel argument in the context of healthcare where people say we've got the greatest healthcare in the world because princes from Saudi Arabia come here to get a surgery, as opposed to saying we've got the greatest healthcare in the world because um, everyone has access to it. <laughs> Or something to that effect, right? I mean, there's 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 a choice implicit that we're making as to how we decide what a good economy is. I think we all agree here that a good economy is one that works for the greatest number of people, as opposed to creating the greatest number of billionaires. Um, talk about that illusion that greed is good in terms of the economy and where that where that came from, and um, and, and and why that's illusory. Why that's illusory. Right. So, I, I mean, I think the um, one of these key statistics that came out recently from the Federal Reserve is that 40 percent of uh, U.S. households uh, say they would have great difficulty covering an unexpected $400 uh, bill that that came in. Um, so that that suggests that um, despite all of Trump's claims, we have an economy where uh, a huge number of people are living just at the at the margin. I mean that uh, you could have a four hundred dollar bill, you know, from um, a car repair or the refrigerator breaking. Um, so um, that this is an indication that um, there's a direct connection between um, the growing number of billionaires and the amount of income being taken by the top one percent of households. And the impact that it has on forty uh, percent of the population living in conditions of, you know, economic precarity. So, um, so where did this idea that uh, people who should should just um, maximize their income um, by any means? Uh, where did this greed is good idea come from? And again, I think that um, a lot of it. Um, is connected to these right-wing thinkers and the the impact that they had. So uh, Milton Friedman, um, uh, the kind of uh, key figure of free market economics in in the U.S., uh, wrote a famous article where he said, uh, "What's this? All this talk about the social responsibility of business?" Uh, he said, "The only social res- responsibility of business is to maximize profits um, because it's by following the signals of the market uh, that capitalism works, that the businesses know how to make money. And even when he wrote that, he knew that he was lying, that in fact, everybody knows that businesses can maximize profits by polluting, by uh, producing harmful products by uh, damaging their workers' lifespans and and so forth. So, These are all externalities. Um, Let me just interject here. These are all externalities, right? Like I'm going to make my profit. I'm going to prof- uh, I'm going to privatize the profits, socialize the costs. 
If we're if we're too quick with our R and D and we don't do the proper research, all right. So maybe some people will die, but we're going to sell billions of dollars in our of our uh, of our drug if uh, if we uh, don't want to expend uh, the money on the proper quality of steel. Uh, we're going to make a lot of profit, and maybe a couple of buildings will fall. Whatever it is, right? So that Friedman's argument was wrong from the from the get go. It was um, an an argument to um, get regulators off the back of business. Uh, Trump repeated this rhetoric, you know, during the 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 last election campaign. But the reality is that those regulations are part of what makes the economy work. Uh, this gets back to the point that I made before about predation, uh, predation and imposing these externalities or public bads like um, pollution or um, in Boeing's case, making planes that don't stay up in the air because they um, were um, – Um, under pressure to get the plane to the market quicker or whatever. Um, All of those um, um, show that it's only when there's an effective regulatory apparatus which says, whoa, you can't make money um, by hurting people. You can't make money uh, by cutting corners. Only then... uh, do we have an effective um, market economy? So they've um, the the greed is good story was never true um, that market economies have always required a counter narrative which says uh, greed is dangerous, greed um, is destructive. And I say in the book that one of the reasons that um, all these years later. Uh, Dickens' Christmas Carol um, remains such a kind of important part of our of our culture is that uh, Dickens recognized this very early that greed is extremely dangerous and destructive, and he wrote a morality story that told about uh, precisely that the 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 horrors uh, of greed and the and the need for. Uh, for greed to be offset by um, a, a love of others, a respect for others, a, a respect for the legal rules, and and so forth, and we've we've um, gone so far in the direction of glorifying greed, of of celebrating these these billionaires, whether uh, their money was made uh, legitimately or like the. Oxycontin fortunes, right. you know, made at the expense of of consumers and people, um, that you know we we've um, failed to recognize that um, markets work when they're um, constrained by values, when they're constrained by rules. All right. So, uh, and and I think uh, some would argue, particularly around these parts, that um, uh, there is there, there's really only uh, different gradations of just how much um, uh, billionaires have exploited people. Uh, you know, they're not all necessarily the Sackler family, but uh, they're just a different flavor, perhaps, in some respects or another. But with that said, let's just talk about, I want to just uh, turn to the notion of, of reform versus revolution and the concept of of socialism, because I think like, you know, people are um, people, I think, are more savvy in the past five or 10 years, it seems to me, to the idea of you can have certain measures of socialism. Right. I mean, you it is because you argue here that what we need is to democratize the economy and you can democratize the economy in various amounts. Um, You can get. All of what the people want in terms of the economy, some of what the people want, uh, you know, uh, a, a democratized economy, um, it, it, you know, you, uh, $12 an hour a minimum wage is probably not as democratized as $20 uh, a minimum wage. Uh, but you can have gradations of this. And we don't have the same concept with capitalism, it seems to me, um, although, you know, it's all set up as if. Uh, the the socialistic policies, you know, 
chip away at the existence of capitalism as opposed to their both ingredients in the economy. Uh, and I, maybe capitalism is not even the right word in that context. But just speak to the idea of reform versus revolution and this idea of, of, of having certain amounts of socialism. Right. So uh, essentially um, what I'm trying to debunk is this, th- that this idea that capitalism is this existing thing um, and um, that the reality that I'm saying is that um, market economies um, have always been mixed. They involve a very substantial state role, uh, both in regulating and providing certain things like uh, police and fire and um, a whole bunch of public goods like education and health health care for the poor and, and so forth. So the the reality is that Um, What we've had historically for hundreds of years now um, is a mixture of of, uh, state and market provision. So if you want, you can say we've always had a a mixed economy. And um, so in that sense, um, I'm arguing that um, the the way in which our political rhetoric says, you know, that we can either have capitalism or we could have Bernie Sanders socialism um, is a misunderstanding. Um, It's much more of a continuum. Uh, We already have a mixed economy. Uh, We can expand um, the, the more socialistic, the more democratic aspects of that economy. And what I'm arguing is, um, there's a good chance um, that by expanding those more democratic aspects of the economy, uh, we could make the economy work more effectively. W- one of the things that we didn't um, mention kind of in the, in the story here is that w- one of the key um, mechanisms which has made our uh, society less democratic are this series of Supreme Court rulings culminating in Citizens United, which said that we can't regulate campaign contributions because money is the same thing as speech. And uh, the the Constitution says that we have to um, allow free speech. So we have to allow the billionaires and millionaires to make um, virtually unlimited campaign contributions, because otherwise we would be interfering with their speech rights. Now, this is a, a ridiculous argument, because um, money and speech are two different things. Uh, but the consequence of it has been to tilt our politics towards um, the interests of the wealthy, um, that this this kind of increasing wealth and income inequality has been a vicious cycle because when they get so much money, they can plow it back into the political process. Um, We saw this after Trump's election, Uh, the millionaires and billionaires who had um, contributed to his victory were rewarded with tax cuts that gave them even even more money. And we know they're going to come back uh, in the next cycle and, and donate even more to protect their privilege. So what I'm arguing is that if we go in the opposite direction and we say uh, these Supreme Court rulings are wrong, we reverse them, we start to regulate the role of money, uh, we would be making our system more democratic because it would move it back towards one person, one vote. Uh, ordinary people would have a greater voice in the political process. Uh, we would start to get uh, regulations uh, that place limits on um, the um, the kind of predatory behavior, the imposing of externalities or public baths. Uh, but we could also get uh, better tax legislation that um, e- even Warren Buffett talks about how under the existing tax rules, he pays taxes at a lower rate than his secretary because right. he can exclude part of his income as carried interest that's only uh, taxed at 15 so- percent. Uh, so we could then use that tax revenue uh, to improve the public schools, to provide um, health care for everyone um, to 
begin right. to implement the, the Green New Deal. And I would argue that that would invigorate our economy, make it um, more more dynamic and effective. I think, I mean, I think um, uh, we're fairly well sold on the on the on the policy prescription. Lastly, let's just end with the with the sort of the the the, the tactical and rhetorical, um, uh, you know, I think to a certain extent, uh, based upon what you're you're you've 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 written your. I mean, and what we're the suggestion is, in many respects, to abandon the word uh, capitalism in terms of its critique, and rather focus more on this uh, from a rhetorical and just simply a um, uh, uh, an attempt to, I guess, um, uh, empower people to re- rather argue the that instead of a critique of capitalism, it really should be just a promotion of more democrat, more democracy in the context of our economy and our decision makings about our economy. Exactly. And uh, I mean, and this is connected. This is very directly connected to the crisis of democracy that's going around on around the world with uh, increasing uh, rise of authoritarian leaders and illiberal Democrats who are uh, eroding the institutional structures of democracy. Part of the reason that this has happened is that um, over this last uh, 20 or 30 years of market liberalism or, or around the world, um, people have been angry. They've been angry about austerity. They've been angry about uh, deteriorating public services. They're angry about stagnant real wages. And yet uh, the dominance of these market ideas uh, have meant that politicians tell them, sorry, we can't do anything about it. We have to have more austerity. We can't give you what you want. And that's the context in which people have begun uh, turning to extremist movements, to authoritarian leaders. Um, and we we saw that with some of the, the support for uh, Trump in, in the last election. Um, so the way in which we both preserve democracy and deepen it is by uh, is by um, using democracy to address these fundamental economic issues, like the the way that wealth and income are distributed, um, the decisions about what the what the economy produces. So, um, so I I agree with you completely that um, what we need to put on our banners is. Um, more democracy, deeper democracy. Um, let's trust the people, uh, but trusting the people means giving them more power uh, relative to the elites who have um, fantastic quantities of, of wealth. Fred Block, the book is Capitalism, the Future of an Illusion. Thank you so much for your time today. really appreciate it. Oh, I, I had a good time. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, folks, there it is. Capitalism, the future of an illusion. Uh, We're going to take a break, head into the fun half of the program, wherein we will have fun. Um, Tomorrow on this program, uh, I anticipate having a pre-tape of a very special guest, briefly, who will be uh, commenting on uh, some uh, public uh, comments he will be making this afternoon. I knew this day would come. But I didn't expect it so soon. We finally got Trump. It will not be Seb Gorka. It will not be Donald Trump. You're doing a great um, show, majority report. Everyone knows it. You know, you get uh, you, you, sometimes you you get uh, an interview. You don't want to promote it too much because if you don't, if it doesn't, if these things happen. Sometimes these people have very busy schedules. They're engaged in very busy activities. Um. So uh, hopefully we'll have that uh, for you uh, tomorrow. I always make time for you. The Watch. AJ Benza of Progressive Talk. In fact, go on to uh, sign up for our Instagram um, uh, feed, as it were. Somebody mocked me for like, like I said, sign up for Instagram. Or get Instagram. Follow us on Instagram. Follow sign us. Sign up for Instagram so you can follow us on Instagram. Exactly. Sign up for Instagram. There's. <laughs> I know I'm not a big Instagrammer. 
<laughs> uh, follow us on Instagram, folks. What, I, what is the name of our thing? MajorityReport.fm? I don't know where the hell that came from. I don't know. Why don't you ask the robots that you hired to scab on us? Yeah, I know. Um, I got to talk to the uh, AI that's handling this. Follow us on Instagram. We will point. make the announcement first on Instagram. That's what we'll do. Yeah. Boom. So what the majority report has to consider is that there's going to be a point in the not too distant future where AI is not only running the Instagram, but actually are taking their jobs. And that's great? another good reason. No, I'm trying to. It's actually. Yeah, it is. It's Andrew Yang. Oh, so basically, same Greg. difference. <laughs> Our caller, Greg. Yeah, it's. I finally discovered how to do Andrew Yang's impression, and it's just a what slightly if been Greg slowed down. Along. It's Greg yeah. all along. Yeah. Hi, you might know me as Andrew Yang or Greg with a libertarian really, perspective. Um, that's when we tried to get Andrew Yang on the program, and he just uh, responded like, "I like I've been calling, calling for years." In for years. <laughs> Well, I was wondering because he was on with Mehdi Hassan and Mehdi was asking him about some other stuff outside of his usual talking points and, um, you know, like what to do about the Middle East. And I was a little confused when he said that uh, through the power of visually, yeah, I was just like, jet packs. Yeah, jet, yeah. Uh, uh, if we had a technological solution, then the Palestinians could actually live in Jordan in a way where their <laughs> living standards would uh, really actually be in excess of even the average life expectancy in someone in Lebanon in 1982. So I'm just looking at practical solutions. <laughs> With VR, it doesn't really matter where they are. There will be a time right. when the Instagram robots will actually be in a position to steal anybody's spouse by 2030. So I think we need to think seriously about that. And I don't think genetically the members of the majority report would necessarily like that. It's the type of thing we need to plan for. Folks, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Join the majority report.com. Check it out. Become a member. Support this program. Um, we uh, we could use your support. Uh, also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Yesterday was Tuesday night. Uh, Michael, apparently there was uh, YouTube was down for the live streaming. But, YouTube uh, was down. But, it doesn't really matter but, because yeah. if we're talking about it on Wednesday, it's not like anybody can go back in time and li watch it live anyways. It's always available as a podcast or YouTube. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we handled it well. It's available. Um, what was that? Oh, was uh, that you? My, my Siri is being set off like once a show now. <laughs> Well, I don't know how to do control. that. I, I don't know even how it got turned on. But that I was say, connectivity. Like, I say because <laughs> I like I'm finding like I'm going like serious, Lee. Is that true? Yes. And here it goes. Watch. Oh no, it didn't work. All right. To help with connectivity. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. When Brendan, Brendan said serious stage fright. Go ahead. Go. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the show is now fully uploaded on YouTube and iTunes and Patreon, of course. Uh, I will uh, jam-packed show uh, with Bashkar Sunkar and Ben Burgess. We talked about the history of socialism, the Meidner Plan, which was this incredibly interesting historical moment in Sweden. Uh, and then, of course, with Glenn Greenwald, we went into all of the different aspects of these Lava Jato revelations. And of course, I mean, it, you know, this means a lot to me. We've been covering it. I've been covering this even in a time when, you know, it just wasn't getting talked about nearly enough. And now to see Bernie Sanders call for Lula to be immediately released means a ton. So we did a, uh, you know, and then there was also uh, some stuff on how it connects to the Assange and Snowden cases. I will say, actually, even though we stuck the topic and I make no apologies for sticking the topic, Glenn and I did actually bicker about something. So, oh, really? Well, nothing, nothing too intense, but we had we saw some a few things differently about that case. Or one thing. So, at any rate, uh, and then in the post game Andrew Yang impression debut, uh, among other things, uh, Patreon.com. Also, TM, your book title and my book title. Jesus Christ, I didn't even remember that. It was well, it was it was crazy. It was like a twenty minute late start. Yes, you can find the title of my book, which will be published this fall from Zero Books, and obviously I'll be talking about that more soon. Patreon.com slash TMBS and grab your tickets to the Chicago show August 24th. Check this out. Uh, we'll go right you there. You got it? Yeah. No, no. This is something that just came across my transom. What is it? According to Luke O'Brien, an Ohio federal judge this morning awarded 
comedian, sometimes a commentator. On the, we've had him on the show back in the day. He's on uh, Sirius Talk Radio, or he was. Uh, we'll see about that. $4.1 million in damages in his libel suit against neo-Nazi Daily Stormer publisher Andrew Anglin. Who is this? Almost $3 million more than Obadala was seeking. Nino Badala just... Yeah. Just just on the day that um, that uh, Kyle asked me if we could take down the Sam Cedar tier of membership on the program, which is a thousand dollars a month, I've been waiting for someone I know to hit it, hit it big like this. Why does he want to take it down? He's just it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, it's not. It is ridiculous. I can't hear you. Know you. Oh, sorry. You know what's more ridiculous is the new phone system, Kyle. What's wrong with the phone system? The update that we need him to... He did it. Oh, he did it? Yeah, Great. the button's right there. Oh, okay. It was there last night. I didn't use it last night. We didn't take it. Oh, oh connectivity wow. too, Yeah, there we go. Too, it, was too, it was too jam-packed. Dino Badal is never going to give you any of his money now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a really good Atlantic Jamie. piece on uh, that guy that he sued from about a year or two ago. I'm going to sue distant. everybody. I'm going to sue everybody. <laughs> Hi, D- uh, Dino Bagala hey, well, made money. We got a clip of I, we got a clip bought... of David Pakman uh, for the fun half that I think may be grounds. Well, I don't want litigation report. I don't report. think, I don't think we should be report. joking about that. I Let's just go. think David Ugh. really keeps stepping. Okay, da- well, David's a habitual line we'll, stepper. We'll go. This week on the Antifada, we too have on the great Ben Burgess on this week's show. Um, we talk a little bit about his book, give them an argument, Logic for the Left, uh, out now on Zero Books. Um, but you know what? He's been talking about his book a lot lately. So we tried something a little different. And in addition to that, we had him kind of referee some arguments that we've been having lately with uh, figures such as Stefan Molyneux, uh, a bunch of Elon Musk fanboys after I was randomly in a video that went somewhat viral talking about Elon Musk. And um, we talked about how Marx could be the messiest bitch ever and insult everyone all the time and yet still be right about everything. His arguments be correct. It, he was especially nasty, I will say, to the uh, Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin. Um, in a letter to Engels written in 1863, he said, and I quote, Bakunin has become a monster, a huge mass of flesh and fat and is barely capable of walking anymore. To crown it all, he is sexually perverse and jealous of the 17-year-old Polish girl who married him in Siberia because of his martyrdom. He is presently in Sweden, where he is hatching quote-unquote revolution with the Finns. (laughs) Matt. Uh, Yeah. What he would have said about Dave Literary Hangover, uh, the most recent public episode is a Margaret Fuller episode. Uh, check that out if you don't know who she is. And then for patrons, we have the Such Such for the Joys uh, essay by George Orwell. Uh, and we'll have more interesting stuff coming up. Okay, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun app. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun app. Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a bad man. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks. <laughs> reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. 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 F
Almost says what? What 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 Seems that there's a much more negative view of fashion than Tommy. Hell of a lot of back. Hell of a lot of back. All lives matter. Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. The alpha males are back. Why do you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. They can't argue fuck your things points. I do for the bigger game plan. Go at a minute. It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are back. Back. Hello. Africans are black. Black. Pussy, 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 pussy